Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. NOAA Live webinars will be offered most Wednesdays during the school year at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. To get more information, simply visit the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education webpage or follow us on Facebook. This series is designed to help you get to know NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and some of our incredible experts across the country. Today, we are introducing you to Mark Dixon and Jillian Phillips, both with NOAA's Northeast Fishery Science Center in Milford, Connecticut. While we'll be talking about NOAA's work at the Milford Laboratory, we wanna recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Mark and Jillian are coming to us from the land of the Pawgusset people. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear them. However, there is a box where you can write questions. You can find that now. We encourage you to ask them as we go and I'll be keeping track for Mark and Jillian. They'll stop every now and then and answer a few. We may not get to all of your questions, but we're going to try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Great. Thanks, Nicole, for that great introduction. And I want to make a special chance to thank everyone who worked behind the scenes at NOAA Live and at the Milford Lab to make this presentation possible. Go ahead, Jillian. So just a quick introduction to myself. I'm a biological science technician at the Milford Lab. And here's a photo of me. And I'm wondering if, if you guys still dress like this when you get your school photos done every year. So I grew up along the New Jersey coast, along the, the ocean and salt marshes. And you know, growing up there gave me the opportunity to understand how important those resources are and made me think that maybe that was something I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Go ahead, Jillian. Hi, my name is Jillian. And I um, am over here coming to you from Georgia, um, even though I live in Connecticut now. Here's a picture of me when I was about seven um, doing some gardening from a landlocked city of Georgia, although I did find myself on lakes and rivers, which easily translated to me now working with NOAA um, on Long Island Sound, which Mark will be telling us about in just a minute, and I will see you back for one of our future stops. Enjoy. The Milford Lab is located in Connecticut, and you can see on the map of the whole country that we're up way up in the northeast corner of the country, and we're on Long Island Sound, which is an estuary between the shoreline of Connecticut and Long Island, New York. And some of you may remember from previous talks that an estuary is a place where freshwater and saltwater meet, and it's a really important habitat for lots of plants and animals. Go ahead, Jillian. So one of the things that we do at the Milford Lab every year is we hold an open house. And this year, we're really excited about the opportunity to develop some virtual content as an open house offering. And that means we can invite many more people to visit the lab. And we're really excited about the opportunity to premiere this with you tonight. So we're going to set this up as a quick tour of the lab. And here's some of the highlights we're going to see along the way. The lab has very humble beginnings, starting at about 1935 with one researcher in just a couple small buildings. And he was given the task of restoring oyster production in Long Island Sound. And that's important because oysters are important for cleaning the water, providing habitat for other organisms, and they're an important food source and important to the economy for providing jobs. That's good, Chris. Yeah, great, thank you. So here's a picture of the lab today and some of my colleagues dressed up for Halloween. 
And you can see Jillian's there right in the front in her white costume. And I'm in the back corner there, the shark. And here's some more of my colleagues working. And you can see that the two first photos that we see are wet labs. And a wet lab is a really neat spot where we have running seawater that comes into the building and we can do experiments. And we'll see a little bit more about that later. And then the last photo is an actual farmer working with oysters on the farm. And here's some more of my colleagues at work. We have the first photo being our genetics team working with shellfish here in genetics. Uh, the middle photo is my boss, again, working with a farmer at the actual farm site. And then the last photo is two members of the scuba diving team out on the research vessel and some more of our researchers out doing actual field work instead of in the lab. And we'll learn more about that field work as we go on today. So this is probably a really good point to stop and see if anyone has any questions. Okay, this is Nicole from the chat box. Can you hear me okay? Great, Nicole. Great. Um, so um, Thomas asks, how much time do you spend out in the field versus in the lab? So that's a great question, Thomas. And it really depends on everyone's job. But for me, it's about half and half. Uh, and obviously there's more field work when the weather's nice and more lab work and computer work when the weather's not so nice, but it's about half and half. Great. Um, another question from Kelly. She asked, how old is the building that you showed? So are you still, did you add on to that original building or is it a different one? So the original building was literally a shack about um, the size of your car. And that building is still on the facility, but we've added on and added many new buildings and uh, docks for our boat and other facilities and some modern computing technology. But yeah, we have the original building still sitting there. Oh, interesting. Um, is that building accessible to the public? So you know, we try to make things as accessible as possible but we're not open for the public to visit on a daily basis, but we do have our annual open house and we often are open for other visitors to come. And we work with colleagues from all over the world that come to our lab. Great, well, that, that feeds into Connor's question. He wants to know how does COVID-19 affect your job? So as you can probably tell, Connor, from looking at, um, my presentation and Jillian's presentation, we're not at the lab right now, we're, sit we're sitting in our houses. So it really has changed how all of us go about our daily routines. So in Milford, there's a few of us that are going in once or twice a week because we have living animals, we have running seawater, uh, we have you know very expensive systems we have to maintain, but a lot of us are working from home. Great. And then I think Jody asks a question that everybody wants an answer to, which is, what kind of fish is that that we're looking at right there, Mark? So that looks like it's a male black sea bass. And you're going to see a lot more of that as the talk goes on. <laughs> Great. Well, let's move on then. That's a good place to keep going. So we introduced by saying we have humble beginnings. And as long ago as 80 plus years ago, we wanted to increased production of oysters and that seems like a long time ago but if we look at this picture graph of oyster landings and we think about a really large oyster being a lot of oysters being landed and a really small one being not many we can see that actually the peak of oyster landings was in 1880 so 140 years ago that was before gasoline cars and before people had electricity in their homes and that amount of landings was actually more than the entire United States population is now. And that little small oyster there over in 2000 is less oysters than most, than the people living in most cities these days. Go ahead, Jillian. So here's a question for all of you. Who remembers what shellfish aquaculture is? Okay, this is Nicole from the chat box. So. Kids, this is your chance. For those of you who have attended some of these webinars before, 
Does anyone have any ideas about what shellfish aquaculture is? We'll give you a chance to um, type in the chat box. Um, and while we're waiting for that, um, Mark, uh, Michelle wants to know, can we eat all oysters? So if you find an oyster sitting on the beach, I would not eat it. But if you see an oyster in a restaurant or at a seafood market, or on an oysterman's boat, then it's safe to eat because they followed all the rules and regulations for making sure that it's safe. Great answer. Okay, so let's see. Darcy says that shellfish aquaculture is where you grow and harvest shellfish like a farmer. And it's Jess, the perfect oh, let, me, answer. <laughs> let me give you a few more. Uh, let's see, Jess says oyster farming. Um, Connor says farming. Uh, Texas says farming shellfish. Good job, Texas, because I know you're in Colorado. Um, let's see, propagating shellfish in large quantities, says Ola. And uh, Isabella says farming. Well, I think I can turn over the rest of my talk to all you students out there, because you know all the answers so well. <laughs> They're good. Let's go ahead, Jillian, to the next slide. So the first stop on our on our tour is the um, is the wet lab, and we're going to see this little video to introduce us to the wet lab. And we can see here we've got running seawater coming into the building and going into these chambers. And in each one of those small chambers, there's an oyster, and we're seeing how the oysters eat. And this is one of my colleagues, Shannon, and she's actually going into each one of those chambers. And you see that small little pipette in her hand. She is actually picking out the poop from each oyster as it eats. And then there's a second pile that the oysters make, and that's the material that they reject before it even goes into the digestive system. So there's two piles, and by us sampling those two piles, we can tell exactly what the oysters are eating over time. Got to have good eyes and steady hands to do this job. And you can see that everything is numbered and each sample goes into a very specific tube. So here's a close up of the oyster and you can see it's making two piles, one pile of poop and one pile of rejected material. Here's a close up of another part of the system and we can see we have three tanks, each with oysters in it. And this is how we do experiments. We do extra copies of everything to make sure that what we're learning is is real and not just an artifact of one of the tanks so if we do multiple copies it helps and here's some video of me so i'm taking the samples that shannon just took of both water and the poop and then we filter it and it's kind of worked just like a coffee machine there's a paper filter in the bottom of each one of those cylinders we put the sample on the filter and as the water's drawn through Anything that's in the water, the material stays behind. And that allows us to then weigh the material so we know exactly how much each oyster is eaten and we know exactly how much food was in the water to start. And you can see I'm measuring things pretty carefully. I've got a notebook in front of me, so I'm taking careful notes as I go. And this is all down again in our wet lab, which is a way we can bring seawater from Long Island Sound into our building to do these sorts of studies. It looks glamorous, Mark. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so since we just did that pretty exciting video, maybe there's some more questions that we've had people think about. Yeah, so um, so one, given that we've seen you do some of your work there, um, one of our participants was asking, what is your favorite part of your job? So we're gonna see my favorite part of the job a little later on in the talk, but I really enjoy going out in the field and doing field work. And I really like working with our colleagues who are doing this for a living. So the people that the actual farmers, because we're doing the science, but the farmers are doing this for a living. So we're, we're our job really is to help them. So that's, that's kind of the most rewarding part and going out in the field. Great, um, well, I'm looking forward to seeing that video. Um, Ola is asking if you can do the same sampling that you demonstrated with other shellfish like scallops and clams. So we have done this work in probably more than a dozen different places, including at least three different countries with oysters of two species, 
mussels of three different species and sea scallops and bay scallops. And I think at least two or three species of clams. Is their poop the same? Um, it's the same mechanism, how it works. It looks a little different in each species, but yeah, pretty much is the same. And they, they, it goes through their body the same, no matter what the species. Interesting. Um, okay, so Pasquale has to know, see Jillian's putting these photos up for us. So we've got we've to know what kind of fish this is. So I'm not going to tell you, Pasquale, because I think Jillian's going to tell you later on when the video is running, and it'll be more exciting when it's a video. Okay, good. All right. Well, we'll wait for that. So we'll keep you in suspense. It is not the same type of fish, though, in answer to your question um, that was on the other one. Um, let's see. In, uh, Texas would like to know, what were the oysters eating in your experiment? So we're going to make another stop at the lab in a few slides, and I'll tell you exactly what they're eating. Oh, yeah, Texas. That's my favorite stop. I think you're going to like that. Um, and, okay, Henrik asked a very important question since we're having, um, you know, biological discussions. Uh, he wants to know if fish pee. They sure do. All right. That's why you don't drink the water when you swim in the ocean. <laughs> All right. Um, and one final question. You were in the tanks that you showed in the wet lab. Um, does the water go back into the ocean after you're done using it for your experiments? It does. So we try to make sure we alter it as little as possible and we never add anything to it. So it's pretty much going back the way it came in. Okay. All right. Well, I think we should move on to our next stop. So our next stop is really important because if you're going to do shellfish aquaculture, you need to start with the animals in the hatchery. So we have a, a hatchery at the Milford lab and we developed what's called the Milford method, which is now used around the whole world. In these next few slides, we'll talk about that. So we've got a picture of the old lab and a picture of the new lab. And we can see there are certainly some similarities, but we've also really modernized things as, as time goes on. So we try to stick to our, our roots of what we do at the lab, but we try to make sure we're using the latest technology. You go ahead, Jillian. So this is just a really quick diagram of a life cycle of an oyster where we start with adults and we have the whole life cycle in one picture. But we're gonna talk more about that. So we can go to the next slide. So we're gonna start at the beginning of the life cycle and that's spawning. And oysters are what are called broadcast spawners. They broadcast their egg and sperm into the water column where fertilization happens outside of the, of the shellfish. And go ahead, Jillian. Oh, I wanna add quickly too that an adult oyster can make about, adult female can make about 30 million eggs in one spawn and only less than 1% of those will survive. So this is a, a close-up picture of newly fertilized um, larvae. These are swimming in the water column and though they're not microscopic, they'd just be little specks if we didn't have this microscope to look at them. Uh, next one, Jillian. And here we see a real close-up of one of those larvae. And you can see they actually have these cilia all over their outside of their body that help them swim. So they swim in the water column for two to three weeks before they set, which is our next slide. So once the oysters set, they're starting to grow up and turn into adults. The setting process in the wild happens on other oyster shells, on clams, on rocks, on the bottoms of people's boats, on pilings. Uh, but in, in a farming setting, we like to actually set each individual oyster on its own. It makes it much easier to grow and harvest and get to the restaurant eventually. Go ahead, Jillian. So those slides are kind of where the research at the Milford lab stops, and then the animals would go out to a farm. And once they're on the farm, they're put on the bottom, and they're moved around, and they're, and they're kept clean, and they're kept fed by the, by the environment now. And after about two years, they're big enough to harvest and go to a restaurant or go to a market. Go ahead, Jillian. So I think this is another good point for some more questions. Great, this is Nicole from the chat box again. Um, so Katya would love to know, how do you collect those shellfish that you use in your experiments? 
So we work really closely with our partners who are farmers or with uh, state agencies that help us collect the animals from the wild. We bring those adults into the lab and that's where we start our spawning from those wild adults or adults from farms. Um, and Katya also as a follow-up wants to know how long do they live? So most of these that are on farms are usually harvested in two to three years. In the wild, they might live up to 10 or 15 years. Um, but most oysters aren't living that long in the wild anymore because most of them and almost all the oysters in the country now are farmed. Great. Um, Grace asks, how old are the oysters when they set? And do they so, move and swim as adults? So once they're set, they do not move anywhere. They stay where they are. Some shellfish do move around, but uh, oysters do not. And they usually set after about three weeks of being larvae in the water. Great. Um, Ginger asks, uh, does the hatchery help to replace the oysters that are harvested or damaged due to storms? So our research, and again, we're a research lab, so we're not, we're not producing millions of animals to go to a restaurant or to go to a farm. We're doing science to help others do that. But there are hatcheries whose main goal is what's called restoration, and they're putting out the small little larvae, small little set oysters back into the environment to recreate habitat and recreate oyster reefs. Got it. Um, Harry's asking, and I think we might cover that in the next stop, but he wants to know if we ever sell the oyster larvae to the farmers. So we don't do that, but there are nurseries and hatcheries that that's their main business. They produce literally millions and millions a year. Some they keep for themselves and others they sell to other farmers, but we're just doing research at our lab. Um, okay, Isabella has a good question that I would love the answer to too. How do oysters stick to rocks? So they have a little cement that they make just when they're getting ready to set. And once they settle out of the water column and hit that appropriate surface, usually another shell if they're lucky, then they, they create that little cement on their shell and they glue themselves there. And then that literally lasts the rest of their lives as they grow. Cool, they're cement makers, that's pretty cool. Um, let's see, Alice and Paul were asking if, I think you said 30 million eggs, right? Correct. Is that that okay. Of those 30 million eggs in that one spawn, how many are likely to become adults? So in nature, it's very few, maybe only one or two even. Uh, a female just has to have one survive to replace herself. In the nursery setting, to be a successful farmer, the farmer is looking for about 20% as a maximum, probably a little less usually. Okay. Um, now we have a, a specific question in Virginia. Charlotte would like to know if you ever work with the farmers on Chicoteak Island. So we have worked with a group called Cherry Stones and they do have farms on Chicoteak for both clams and oysters. Okay. And then one more question uh, and before we move on, I just um, cut you yes, another good question. Um, what are the oysters predators? So when they're small in the water column, that's why there's 30 million to start with and only a few that survive because they get eaten by everything that eats out of the water column. They get swept away by currents. They get dried up if they get washed up on the beach. Once they've settled, it's things like fish and crabs mostly. And there's a few snails that will also drill into the shell and eat from the inside. Wow. Okay, I think that's good for now. Let's let's move on to the next stop. So our third stop is our microalgal laboratory library in the in the laboratory. And you can see here we have over 200 species of microalgae that we keep in the lab. And this is my colleague Lisa, who managed that, that collection. And these are really important because they form the base of the food chain. And if we go to the next slide, we can see what that means. So these are you can see there's a bunch of different colors. There's some green ones, some brown ones, some dark brown ones. And this is the food 
for the oysters. And sometimes it's called phytoplankton because it's photosynthetic plankton. It can turn sunlight and carbon dioxide into sugar, which means it makes its own food, just like the plants on land. And we at the lab have spent many years discovering which are the best phytoplankton to feed the oysters. And we can go ahead to the next slide, Jillian. And this next slide is a close up under the microscope of what these phytoplankton look like. And you can see there's all kinds of crazy shapes and sizes and colors. There's a huge diversity of these. And they're all single celled and they're all microscopic. So they really are these teeny little plants that are forming the base of the marine food chain. You go ahead, Jillian. All right, time for more questions. And I'm not gonna tell you what that is either because that's coming up in the video also. <laughs> all right, good. Pasquale's gonna have to have to hold the suspense. Um, let's see, we don't, we don't have any questions about the laboratory yet. Um, we do have a question about whether octopus eat oysters. Yeah, I would certainly think so. We do not have octopus in Long Island Sound, but I'm sure there are um, places where they, they would. Um, they're, they're, their suckers are ideal for grabbing and sucking something open. We do have a predator in Long Island Sound which has a similar mechanism, and that's starfish. Starfish use all those little feet and suckers to pry open shells. Mm. It's interesting. Um, one thing, uh, circling back from where you started, Texas wants to know um, what made the oyster population decline that started in the 1880s? It was really overfishing. It was overfishing and poor management, which now we, we try very hard. And that's part of what NOAA does is to help prevent that from happening with other species. Mm. Great. Um, Okay, Bodhi, we're not going to tell you what that fish is because Jillian's, we don't want to steal Jillian's thunder. Before we, um, I know Jillian's coming up next. So um, we did get a question, I think from McKenna, who wants to know, what do you mostly do, Mark? What are you, how much of your job is, which part? So you saw the, the small microalgae library with the little small vials. That is only half of our microalgal production. The other half is those large jars and even larger things. We grow algae in containers as big as swimming pools, because when you feed millions of oysters, you need to be able to produce lots and lots of their food. So about half of my job is managing that part of the microalgal production. And the other half is field work and working at my computer and writing emails to people and giving presentations like this. Cool. All right, well, I think we're ready to move on. So our last stop on our tour is our research vessel. And this is a 50 foot research vessel, which is about the size of a bigger than a one school bus, but taller than two school buses. And we can comfortably put about 10 people and safely equipment on this boat. And it's a good size and platform to do day trips in places like Long Island Sound. And we're going to see a lot more about this vessel coming up. So I'm going to reintroduce Jillian, who's going to probably show you the highlight of the whole day. All right, everyone. Um, thank you, Mark, for giving me a great spot to keep going. Um, so like Mark said, this is our Lusanoff. This is our vessel, who is named after Victor Lusanoff, who started the lab. And I'm going to take you a week in the life of a GoPro team member. So these are the highlights um, of the week. They're gonna be words you don't have to read. I'll narrate you through this. So we're zooming into Milford right now. Our lab sits here and this is the Milford Harbor. And we're going to talk today about how we use cameras or specifically GoPro cameras to look at how fish use oyster aquaculture cages. Here's a sneak peek in the engine room. We're just turning on the generators to get the boat ready to go out to sea. Here we are pulling out of the harbor. And while we are steaming out to Charles Island by our NOAA Corps captain, in this video, it's um, Lieutenant Eric Estella, um, we have two main project goals. The first is to identify how fish are using these oyster cages. Um, and habitat is really how are they living, how are they using 
um, and how are they eating in those areas. And then we also want to share what we find with people who make decisions about where to put these oyster farms. And as well as, like Mark said, to the farmers themselves. So here we're looking out the back of the pilot house. One cool thing about our boat is that you can drive it um, facing the front of the boat or the back of the boat, which makes it ideal for things like this. Now we just saw an oyster cage coming up and down off the back. Um, these are the controls that we use in order to make that happen. Going to take a quick pause right here to kind of tell you exactly how we're looking at these cages. So I'm going to be pointing to some things here. We have a main um, oyster cage right here. You can't really see the oysters because they are living inside bags that go in the shelves of this cage. There are six bags per cage and we can fit anywhere from 50 to 200 oysters in a single bag depending on how big they are. So we want to make sure that all the oysters in there have room to grow. And we're actually looking through the lens of a GoPro camera right now. You can see that we are looking across the top of the cage so we can see when fish come down to check it out. Now, these bags right here, this hole right here is about one inch wide. So you can see that some of the mesh gets pretty small and we'll see some really cool fish um, that could even use those for shelter. And we have a second camera angle that we'll see as this cage is being dropped in the water. And here we go. And this is just a little tether to make sure our cameras don't fall off the cages. But here is our second camera angle. You see these bags kind of start to float as we move down into the water. But this camera angle provides us views down each side and then underneath the feet of the cages. Now we deploy our cameras and you know if you notice when it hit the bottom it kind of stirred up some mud so we let our cameras record the following day and we record eight minutes of each hour from 7 a.m to 7 p.m to maximize when it's most light outside so now i'm going to tell you about the four most common fish species we see in long island sound uh-oh Sorry, we're gonna scoot back just a little bit. The first one is cunner. These guys are the smallest fish species that we see. Those are the ones that will go inside the bags themselves. The second is this scup here, who's picking stuff um, to eat off of the cages. Here we have black sea bass, just like Mark spoke about earlier. Um, and then our fourth species is tatog. So black sea bass and tatog are very common. Um, for people to fish out of in Long Island Sound. Now, we're not only looking at fish, how many fish and of what species, we're actually also looking at their behavior. So there's that big male again, who's kind of chasing others out of the way, because that's his cage and no one else can share his cage. Here we have a female hiding from a big male who's very interested in her. And that brings us back to broadcast spawning like Mark spoke about earlier. That's the same way that some fish reproduce. Now we've also seen things that aren't fish like this horseshoe crab. I'll let you know that that video is um, sped up. Um, and then this guy is our double crested cormorant. He's a diving bird. And Pasquale, that fish earlier was that striped sea robin we just saw go by. Didn't forget about you. Um, and the last fish species that we're gonna see are summer flounder. Um, my boss particularly loves these flatfish. And so here, I'm just noting that we take other types of measurements while we are recording. We're looking at light, temperature, um, and current speed and direction. I'm gonna pause on Mark's face here. I think I can say pretty confidently that scuba diving is Mark's favorite part of the job. And he's going to um, take a GoPro down with him. There's Callie jumping in the water. And they're going to be helping us develop a new system. So as we bring cages up, fish can escape um, and other types of 
creatures. Now we want to see what the whole ecosystem of a cage is like. So we're trying to build a, a net that can actually collect everything from the tiny snails that might be eating oysters all the way up to those large fish that we saw in those videos. So here we're bringing up this big, big net that's going to encapsulate everything. And then here you can see some of my colleagues picking out everything that we captured. Now, lastly, we take one more sample. Um, here we are collecting seawater for my colleague UN to look for DNA inside of the water, which is a really cool um, new technology. Um, and as we make our way back to Milford, I wanna let everyone know that we are also trying to provide all of our methods to citizen scientists, to farmers themselves, so that way they can keep an eye on what's going on in their farm um, and anyone else who is, in, excuse me, who is interested. And with that, I will take any questions. Um, here is uh, another oyster cage as we're putting, um, this is our light meter and our current meter, and then a camera here, um, yeah. That's great. Thanks, Jillian. This is Nicole from the chat box. So I'll bet that there are some people with GoPros in our audience that are now thinking they know what they want to do with that underwater housing that they uh, <laughs> haven't had a plan for yet. Um, my son has one of exactly. those. I'm sure he's going to be bugging me after this webinar. Um, so we have a question from Bodhi. He is asking, um, you know, as we're stand, looking at these guys standing in front of the cages, what, what are the dimensions of those? How big are the cages? Yes, yeah, so those cages are about four feet by four feet by three feet. Um, so they're not too big, but they do take up a lot of space on the back deck. Um, if they were any bigger, it would be really hard to pull up with our boat. Gotcha, okay. Um, and I had um, another question for Mark. I don't know if Mark wants to come back on since he was um, he was visible in that show. There you are, Mark. Um, uh, I saw you give a signal to the guy on the boat that looked like you were putting your fist on top of your head. And then I saw the guy on the boat signal back to you. Um, we've had some divers in our webinars before, so I was wondering if you might be able to share what that signal means. Yeah, so when, when we're diving, we like to check to make sure that everything is okay. So when we're underwater and close to each other, we give the okay signal, if I can get my hand in the right place, like that. And you saw I did it underwater. But when I'm far away from someone or someone's far away on the boat, they wouldn't be able to see my hand giving the okay signal. So we make this big O on top of our head to mean okay. Oh, I see. So I just, I thought it, I misunderstood the signal. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, okay, for Jillian, um, how many cages can be on the boat at once when you're um, deploying those? Yeah, so I think the most I've seen on the boat is about 12. And that um, includes them sitting on top of each other, about three high, because we want to make sure that everyone has enough space to walk. Um, because you never know when a wave might come in. Um, we want to make sure that nothing is a tripping hazard. So I would say at maximum 12, but there are certainly larger boats um, that can accommodate more cages. Great. Um, so maybe you can clarify something that Texas is um, confused about. Some other people might be as well. Are the fish coming along to eat the oysters? No, actually the fish that we saw, so those, um, actually all of those species that we saw are not interested in the oysters themselves. Um, the bags also protect them from um, some of the other predators, mostly, for the predation that we see is going to be like those small snails um, called oyster drills that Mark was talking about and starfish. Um, now natural populations could see um, other predators like oyster toadfish, uh, but they can't really get to the oysters in the cages like this. Um, great. Um, Michelle is asking, what do you do with the fish you catch in the net? Did I, did I see it? fish being caught? 
Yes, so uh, most of the fish we're going to return. Um, sometimes we will keep some fish so that way we can measure them um, and even dissect them to look and see what they're eating. So one thing that's really important that Mark talked about is the food web. Um, so we want to know if the things that grow on the cages are what the fish that are using those cages as habitat are eating. And so sometimes, unfortunately, the only way to do that is to look at their stomachs. Um, and, but I would say 99% of the fish that we, that are caught are put right back where they belong in Long Island Sound. Great. Um, one quick question before we go to your last couple of slides. Can you just put those oyster cages anywhere, Jillian? No, you cannot. Um, so depending on where you live, um, either a state or a federal agency um, provides what you would call a lease. So you're leasing the bottom of the land. Um, and then they also decide how many cages are allowed on that property. Um, so there's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, so you can't just go out and put an oyster cage down on the bottom because it could be a hazard for swimmers or boaters um, or other types of inshore activity. Excellent, thank you. You want to continue here? Thanks, Jillian. That was a great job. So we're gonna we're gonna make one final stop on our tour of our open house at the Milford Lab, and that is fish printing. And this is one of our favorite activities and favorite activities of visitors who come to the lab. And we've provided some resources for your teachers so you could actually maybe do this in your classroom or even at home, if your parents don't mind you making a mess of the dining room table. Uh, on the on the website for the NOAA Live. So this is a great way to use the resources of the ocean to make a little bit of art and learn more about the fish as you go along. And I think we'll go to our last slide and take any last minute questions. Great, thanks Mark. This is Nicole again. We do have a couple of general questions about the labs, about the lab. Um, Alice asks, are there any other labs like this in any other places? So we're one of the few labs and one of actually the first lab in the country to do this exact type of research with shellfish aquaculture. Uh, there are other labs doing similar work, in, but not many. And most of the NOAA fisheries labs are more focused on fish research, particularly doing things like stock assessments. And maybe in a future NOAA Live, someone will be talking to you about stock assessments. But yeah, what we do at the Milford Lab is pretty unique. But what has happened is a lot of the things we've developed through science are now being done in commercial spaces, in commercial shellfish hatcheries um, and restoration hatcheries in, in states. Great. Um, I, I, I have to give Alice and Paul another credit for another question because I'm kind of curious about this too. Do oysters have a favorite flavor of algae? We saw all those different kinds. So I don't think they, they pick by flavor. But what, what our research has shown is that there are certain algae that are much better for the oysters to grow. And if you're a farmer, obviously you want your animals to be healthy and to grow fast. So we're, when they're in the nursery setting, we feed them about three or four species of algae that really help them grow fast and stay healthy. Once they go back into the water on the farm, then they're just eating whatever is available in the water column. Gotcha. Okay, and here's a question from Sam for Jillian. Um, what kind of training did you have to do to become a GoPro expert for the laboratory? So I have a four year undergraduate degree um, in animal science and pathobiology, go Huskies. And um, I also have a master's in public health. But during that, um, I spent a lot of time looking at animals and fresh water and learning about their behavior and so through that behavior i found my way setting up gopro cameras um, to look at fish um, so i think you'll find a lot of people um, what they wanted to be when they grew up and what they actually do in their adult lives is um, not a straight path but a little bit of a winding one um, but i'm very excited to be here um, sharing our research with you guys Great, and then one final question as we wrap up. 
um, for from Isabella. I guess this would be for Mark since you talked about aquaculture. When did we start farming for shellfish? So the original research at the lab started in the 30s and 40s, and then kind of large scale shellfish aquaculture in this country didn't start until very recently. There's been some smaller operations, but it's only been in the last 20 or 30 years that it's really become popular and been able to provide large amounts of food to the public and really a lot of jobs and a lot of um, generated economy for states. Cool. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today, but um, we, we have to wrap up. But we are so grateful to you both for sharing your obvious passion for what you guys do in Milford. We sure hope that um, next year you're able to do your open house in person so that everyone can come visit. And, uh, and the fish printing, I just want to remind everybody that you saw um, on that last slide, we have video and um, explanations of how to do that at home on the website uh, where we list the registration information for these webinars. So I hope you'll go check that out. Um, we are taking next week off uh, for the Thanksgiving holiday. So we will be back at NOAA Live the following week, following week and we'll be talking about corals with uh, Derek from Miami. So we're very excited about that. Mark and Jillian, thank you guys so much for um, teaching us about what you do in Milford. And I think you and your colleagues have a pretty cool gig out there. So congratulations. Okay, thanks for the opportunity, Nicole. All right, thanks everybody. Thank and thank you, Tricia and Crystal as well. Bye. Bye everyone.